Doha. Capital of Qatar, it sits on a small peninsula of 187 kilometers in the heart of the Persian Gulf. Only large city of this desert country, it emerged from the sand in just a few decades. It became the capital of Qatar in the first half of the 20th century. Before that, Doha was a very small village. With a new phenomenal wealth generated by oil and gas revenues, the city has undergone a tremendous growth, which radically transformed its demographics. Um, the investment in gas proved to be more or, or more so um, significant to the wealth of this country, that its gas reserves are, are they the second or third largest in the world anyway, they're enormous. Aware that the resources that have made it the richest city in the world will one day expire, ambitious measures have been taken in order to diversify Doha's economy. The vision of His Highness the Emir is about creating a sustainable country in the long term. There's been a lot of reflection and a lot of planning about what Qatar should be investing in to remain sustainable in the long term. Doha is redefining itself. And judging by the quantity of construction sites active 24-7, this ambitious city isn't about to slow things down. Qatar is now a world-class metropolis. Yet barely half a century ago, Doha was a small town in a country of less than 50,000 inhabitants. Doha is a new city. It became the capital of Qatar in the first half of the 20th century. Before that, Doha was a very small village. The capital or the important city within Qatar, it shifted. And all these cities around the Qatari Peninsula, where they have their own history as well as Doha. According to history, many, many, many Qataris were migrated from the Arabian Peninsula. The whole Arabian Peninsula is a very dry land. There is no river. Rain doesn't come very often. And if it comes, it comes in a very small quantity and in general food used to be very scarce here so whenever there is a drought people come to the sea to find livelihood to find way of living so they migrated to the gulf area and they settled there it's not something in dna see people who live by the coast they became merchants or fishermen or whatever but those who lives on the midland they live on their livestock camels sheep and whatever and you have these two cultures, Bedouin cultures and the sea culture. We are still a tribal society. Most port cities develop through the port because of commerce. Is that the case with Doha? Every city in the Gulf existed because of sweet water. Historically, it used to be like a transit or resting area for uh, traders. We had a very old trade route between the Gulf in general and Asia. If you are coming from Asia, it's the only route which takes you north. So it's, it's a very important route. Before the opening of the Suez Canal, the Persian Gulf was a shortcut for all Europeans traveling to Asia. But it was the Portuguese who first established a permanent foothold on the Qatari Peninsula. When the Portuguese started coming here in 1508, they changed the whole environment. They stopped all shipping trades. If you want to do any trading, you have to talk to them. You have to pay, pay uh, bribes to them. And after the Portuguese came the Dutch, who stayed for just about half a century, and then the British came. What was the interest of the British in the region? Their main uh, aim was to protect the trade route from their colonies in the East, Far East, like India, China, all the way to Europe. 
The British stayed in this region militarily-wise until the second half of 20th century. And they recently lived and uh, each state get given its independence. Like their predecessors, the British were interested in Qatar strictly for its strategic location. They otherwise perceived the area as a barren desert with a limited economy based mainly on pearl fishing. This was the most important commodity that the Gulf used to export until the Japanese came up with their own pearl that they could grow within their farms. And since then, the whole trade stopped. The whole region went into decline by early 20th century. There was a recession, very bad economic recession, where people couldn't even find something to trade with. After the Second World War, oil was discovered in Doha. By 1950s, it started to be exploited. At that time, it wasn't that much, and it wasn't that high in price. It was just barely makes people survive. The price of oil went very high during the 80s, and the money came from the oil was so huge. All the oil money was poured in Doha. That's why we see these cities boomed during the 1980s. Buildings, infrastructure, everything. All the places we knew as young, it has been demolished now. Because it's expanded so rapidly and so quickly, we couldn't really grasp it. It became very strange for us as a Qatar. With more than 500 births a day and the arrival of 20 immigrants per hour, Qatar has the fastest growth in the world. But immigrants now make up 85% of its population and native-born Qataris have become a minority in their own country. This new reality has dramatically changed daily life in the metropolis. Thirty years ago, Qatar used to live in neighborhoods. In each neighborhood, everybody knew about the other. People used to be very close. Now we lost that. We are a city, really, we are just part of this huge population. This is how we feel now in Doha. We are just growing in a way that we cannot control it. The problem is we are losing our own culture. We have fragment societies within the city. If it's left like this, then every society will close doors around itself. And I guess that's the worst part of it. So I think we have to think seriously about where we are heading. There should be a line drawn somewhere. How big we want Doha to grow? With its countless construction sites, this frantic growth isn't likely to slow down. Modern structures are sprouting in every direction, leaving behind very few traces of what Doha once was. The whole millennia old history of the shape of the city is here in front of us. The center is made of three parts. Old Doha, where we are now, which is old here. Secondly, West Bay over there, this um, extraordinary um, assemblage of towers, love them or, or, or not. And in between the two, the corniche, the curve sets up a dialogue. And here we are talking, singing to West Bay. And, you know, we couldn't be more different. <laughs> So in 1947, and there was nothing but sand here, um, and all of this was the countryside. Um, over there was old Doha, and the souk is always where it always has been. And this is Musharab, so this is what we're looking at. And we are standing just here, where my finger is. And what we can see now is um, the first roundabout in Doha, the first petrol pump in Doha, the first ice house or ice factory in Doha, before the days of air, condition, air conditioning units, the first pharmacy in Doha. And these kind of memories, these kind of shapes, inform what was basically a very pleasant place to live because people had space and good drinking water, Musharab, place of sweet water. And that is what this area was like really through to the 60s. And it began to become into its next era, the sort of increasingly international and increasingly alien or alienating. And in the case of West Bay, you know, it's gone, gone beyond that. Um, losing the connection between the traditional architecture and the deep roots and the present and, you know, looking into the future.
The city's current growth has little to do with its past. And the country's population, of which 80% resides in or around Doha, has more than doubled over the last decade. How did it grow so fast? I think it was on October the 11th, 1939. A telegram was sent by the oil prospecting company saying, we have found oil at Zikrit. And that is the easy answer. That's why it grew so fast. Um, there's never been a shortage of sovereign wealth here. And the investment in gas proved to be equally more or, or more so um, significant to the, to, the, to the wealth of this country, that its gas reserves are, are they the second or third largest in the world anyway? They're enormous. It's quite incredible to see a city grow at such a rapid rate. Well, going fast is difficult because there's less time to think. There's less time to make good decisions. Old cities, they're collages, they're patchworks. They've grown over time, um, as is old Doha. But these large developments in West Bay wasn't there 10 years ago. That was a flat skyline. There was nothing but one or two emerging cores and cranes. That is history speeded up. What does that do in terms of infrastructure? It must be lacking. One immediate problem is traffic flow. A big development generates more traffic flow. The construction of a big development slows down the traffic because there's lots of um, hindrances. Well, you know, the city has to work around that, has to survive. And traffic here is a chronic problem. Developed chaotically in an unprecedented haste, the city's urban structure lacks efficiency. Undeveloped lots are boxed in throughout the neighborhoods, and traveling from one residential area to another is simply impossible without a car. It's a very particularly difficult story if you're over in West Bay. It's a different problem here, but every street is not set up for pedestrians. And people who say, oh, it's too hot, it's too hot. Well, it is too hot for about three months of the year, but that's only a quarter of the year. And in England or Canada, you know, it's freezing cold or raining. So I think this is a highly walkable city for the future, but there's a lot to be done. And this future is already looking in a new direction with projects such as the redevelopment of the Mushareb district in the heart of old Doha. Mushareb, the first suburb of Doha was, of course, downtown. It was, it was city center, and it was extremely tired and extremely unloved. And much thought was given to what its future would be in a prime position right by the souk, right by the diwan. Um, and it was decided that to create something of enormous infrastructure, most of the land was cleared, and a huge basement was built. Here it is being built. And um, it's basically enabling a pedestrian-friendly development with extremely low energy, extremely sustainable infrastructure. It was a piece of old Doha, and now it's about to be reborn. How has Doha evolved differently than, say, cities like Dubai? Dubai has evolved as a city out of control. Doha has grown in a more considered way with perhaps a deeper attachment to its traditions. Their vision is for something which is deeply rooted and it needn't be the biggest in the world. It needn't be the shiniest in the world. In fact, it probably shouldn't be the shiniest thing because it should feel Qatari. It should feel as if it's grown from here. Nonetheless, um, there's a lot of work to be done in Doha to bring it to its full potential in terms of Qatari identity and something which is rooted past and rooted for the future. Here, the alienation that comes with a suburb and so many highways and traffic jams and sort of almost inaccessibility does that produce. Um, I think it is an unresolved issue. After a spur of random development, Doha is now trying to reconnect with its old neighborhood feel with projects like the new Mushareb. It's kind of obvious that this places have potential to be better than they are. But they also have a lot already, which shouldn't go away and be banished in exchange for the new, because it's, it's the bones, it's the clues, the seeds. You really get a sense of community life here. You absolutely do, yeah. It's integrated, people living, people shopping. Obviously, it is not a broad demographic mix. It's quite a tight um, and mainly working class mix, but it's absolutely a strong sense of community. And, you know, it's evolved over time, and I just hope it keeps evolving. The land 
landscape isn't the only element undergoing radical changes in Doha. Its population is also faced with a renewed approach to living space. The constant flow of immigrants converging to Doha over the last four decades has warranted dramatic transformations in the city's residential spaces. communities living in isolated aggregates, the metropolis was gradually reconfigured into a series of parallel worlds. This isn't your typical neighborhood life. People here are clustered in what are called compounds. And beyond the social and cultural adaptation, the climatic reality adds a layer of complications, which generally requires a long transition period. For newcomers, compounds often become shelters. With so few people in the streets of Doha, one can wonder where everyone has gone. The answer? They're all inside, fleeing the heat. As you'll see, malls are some of the busiest areas in the city, it's especially in the summer. Four months out of the year, maybe even longer, four and a half, five. The heat is pretty unbearable at times. It's difficult to go out for any length of time. You go from your air-conditioned home to your air-conditioned car to an air-conditioned mall or restaurant. So in the summer, you can take the kids here, amusement park and the theater is there. It, everything's available indoors, air-conditioned. Many malls in the Gulf have things like ice rinks. So yet it'll be 45 degrees outside, but they'll manage to maintain an ice rink. Impressive. Yeah, I was pretty impressed when I first arrived too to see it here. One of the busiest places in the mall is uh, the exchanges. There are so many expats here. A lot of people coming in from the Philippines or South Asia come here to work as construction workers, waiters, taxi drivers, basically the blue collar and service industry. Do you think that the Qataris appreciate the multiculturalism as much as perhaps the expats do? For Qatar, I think it's a question of balance. Well, they're trying to be part of the global community while at the same time trying to respect their own traditions. And I think that for them has been the challenge in the last 10 to 12 years. There was a development called the Pearl which a bunch of luxury restaurants were being built there and they were going to allow them to serve alcohol. Up until now, pretty much only some five-star hotels and the golf club can serve alcohol. No, no other restaurant, there's no alcohol in the malls, etc. So this was something new. After about a year, suddenly an announcement was made stopping it. This is part of Qataris trying to find that balance. This balancing act between Western values and the preservation of local culture is clearly present in this oversized and contrasted shopping mall. And its less crowded corridors offer a very different decor. All right, so here is a store that you won't see in the West. This is a store that sells the abayas that a lot of uh, Arab ladies wear. And then over here, is a shop that sells um, dresses that a lot of Qatari ladies wear. They tend to wear these under the abayas when they go to parties, functions, weddings. A Qatari wedding is segregated. There's a separate men's party and a separate ladies' party. And at the ladies' party, there's no cameras allowed. You have to leave that at the door. So then the ladies can take off their abayas and they'll be in... Party dress. Party dresses wearing beautiful jewelry and so forth. It's just traditional that the genders don't interact in any way. So, you know, even if a Qatari is here walking through the mall with his family, if his friends see him, they won't come over and say, hello, hey, how's it going, or anything like that, because he's with his family. And it's not considered polite for a man to be asking another Qatari, how's your wife, how's your, your daughter? It's not considered polite. You would normally just go, how's your family? Interest for local culture pushed Glen away from the homogenous neighborhoods in which foreigners are usually confined to settle in the most vibrant quarters of his adoptive city. 
this is one of the older neighborhoods of the city. This would have been the true city 30, 40 years ago. You would not have had any of the fancy developments outside. There would have been no West Bay. There would have been no Pearl or the, the nice compounds where a lot of the uh, foreigners live. It was all here. And now it's mostly taken over by um, the South Asian laborers or other expats because the rents here are cheaper. Buildings are older, smaller. You see there's lots of small shops, restaurants, barbers, there's people walking around, the traffic is busy. It's just a lot livelier than a compound where, you know, it's very manicured, quiet. You might also notice that because most laborers come here on their own, you need to have a certain level of income to be allowed to bring your family, that the gender ratio here is very skewed. In fact, in fact, I'm the only woman here. <laughs> You're the only woman here. <laughs> the gender ratio in Qatar is actually about three men to every woman, especially in neighborhoods like this, where 10, 20, 30 to 1 is probably the ratio. Are they here just for a short period to work and then go back to their families, or do they aspire to bring their families here? I think for many of them, they're just here to work and send money back home. Many of them have been here for years. If they earn enough money that they can bring their family over, then maybe some will. But because the cost of living is so high, then you have an issue of, okay, now you're supporting a family in an area with a much higher cost of living rather than the family staying back home where it's much cheaper. We're in the old part of town. Uh, now there's a call for prayer. I, I don't see anybody moving here. Would you say that Qataris do not live in this part of town? No, uh, for the most part, Qataris don't live in the old city anymore. There are maybe a few of the old homes that maybe they live in, but for the most part, they all now live further out in the city in the more luxury developments or areas where they've built their homes. It's very rare for a Qatari to live in an apartment now. If you get married, you can make an application to the government and they will give you a plot of land and help you with some financial support to help build the house. Thanks to programs like that, Qataris tend to all live in homes out in what we would basically call the suburbs. Doha is the wealthiest city in the world. But is there a middle class here? Sure there's a middle class. I mean, it's not just these people who, laborers who make very little money and then Qataris and some Western expats who make a lot of money. You have the Qataris and, you know, maybe a few of the other, and the other Gulf Arabs sort of forming their own distinct group. And then amongst the expats, probably you have three groups, the Westerners and wealthier ones. Ones who speak Arabic from Lebanon, Syria, or Egypt, North Africa, that'd be another one. And then you have people from South Asia or the Philippines who have come here basically to work to send money home. And if you're, you know, a construction worker working six days a week, making, you know, $200 a month, you're just not going to be in the same world as people who are going to the luxury hotels or malls and those worlds will just never cross. Are there initiatives being taken to bridge the gap between the foreign community and the local Qataris? The city is growing so fast that there's greater concerns that they need to focus on. The infrastructure, getting the construction done, um, getting things ready for 2022 World Cup, which is going to be coming along. They have to start building all the stadiums. But given the population, the growth, how you saw in the malls, there was Qataris, there was expats, there's foreigners. I'm sure it will just take time. But it, could you imagine being a citizen of your country and in a, a space of 15 or 20 years, going from being the majority to being about 15% of the population? It's going to, I don't know, I couldn't imagine what that would be like. growth seems unstoppable. Its surreal financial capacities have led to an overnight 60% wage increase for its government employees 
and a whopping 120% increase for its military forces. With the creation of the Qatar Foundation, the country has even found the means to whip up an ambitious diversity plan through the establishment of Education City, completely devoted to higher education. The vision of His Highness the Emir is about creating a sustainable country in the long term. There's been a lot of reflection and a lot of planning about what Qatar should be investing in to remain sustainable in the long term. One of the key drivers is the creation of a knowledge-based economy, uh, creating value-added services uh, in that sense of in the direction of uh, developing a diversified, responsive, innovative economy. How important is higher education for Doha? It's essential. I mean, education, uh, as a, generally speaking, is, is valued here in Qatar and in, in the culture. I think higher education is really regarded as one of the drivers uh, for the long-term success of the country through these processes of economic diversification, building the knowledge-based economy. And it's one of the reasons that there has been so much investment here, because it is so fundamental. Building the human capital is, is one of the pillars of the, of the national vision. Spread over 14 square kilometers, Education City has attracted many worldly institutions to Doha. Lured by attractive tax benefits, and by the prestige of a Qatari connection, Cornell, Georgetown, and Carnegie Mellon have opened faculties in this distant part of the world, creating a trend for universities from just about everywhere. HEC Paris was the first non-American institution to arrive uh, here at Education City. There are other non-Americans now. I mean, Education City is growing, it's evolving. And we are happy to be part of the diversification of the Education City community. Is there a large percentage of the population that are reaching higher education now? Increasingly. Um, there are more and more opportunities to pursue higher education. In Qatar, people are taking advantage of that. Clearly, um, it is something that's, that's valued by the people, and it's part of the whole vision and, and development of, uh, of the country. What was Qatar Foundation's idea behind inviting foreign universities to establish themselves here? I think there was a realization um, that first education was a very important part of the uh, creating the sustainable uh, economy. I mean, you can't have uh, successful growth and sustained growth without having an educated population. And I think there was a realization that in the past, the, the need to send people out of Qatar and outside of the region to be educated was not sustainable. So there was a real desire to make available locally world-class educational opportunities for the people who are in Qatar. Doha has adopted the soft power approach to reinvent itself. What exactly is soft power? I think Qatar is, is because it's a small country, because it's a relatively new nation, has to cultivate its influence in many different areas. So you see Qatar investing in sports, in culture, and in the economy in politics playing a role increasingly uh, through the Middle East. And um, so, I mean, I, I think as, I think Qatar has realized that um, they need to cultivate friendship and they need to cultivate uh, networks and links in many different areas to continue its development in, in the long term. It's a way of being present. It's a way of ensuring their own uh, interests, uh, given the fact that it's a relatively small country. What I find so exciting about being here is that you really feel like things are moving. You really feel like people uh, have drive and they want to uh, they want to be achieving great things. And it's 
you know, on a daily on a daily basis, it's what you you see all the time, and it's 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 very refreshing. It's a it's a change. Feel a part of something big? Yeah, definitely. Doha is planning on hosting many sporting events over the next while. No, they already are. There's already been a lot of uh, a lot of events hosted. Um, next week, it's the, there's the um, Total Women's Tournament is next week, tennis tournament, and then obviously the World Cup 2022. Although Education City is still under construction, its impact is already very tangible. Access to quality education for all is rapidly opening doors for women in this conservative society. In Education City, there's an overwhelming number of female students versus men matriculating. And in Qatar University also, the number of graduates of women is almost double that of the men. education changed women's lives here in Doha over the past 20 years? Well, in terms of Education City, this is kind of a new thing. Uh, I think one of the universities that's the oldest here is only about a decade here, so it's slowly changing. But there are other benefits in terms of how they raise their children and changing the expectations of women here. Uh, and I do think it's helped kind of move the country forward in a progressive way. What are the expectations and the ambitions of Qatari women? I think that the expectations on them are very high. Um, like Qatar has been trying to nationalize a lot of its different uh, workforce companies because right now they're very heavily dependent on expat workers. So like 85% of this country is imported to work here. So the women, because they're getting so highly educated um, and they're so qualified, I think the expectation is to get them into the workforce. You know, not just doing secretarial work, but doing some of these more demanding jobs. With such a great number of educated women in Doha, is it putting a lot of pressure on the men? You know, that's a good question. There is a problem of divorce here, and one of the reasons cited for that is that Qatari women are becoming more highly educated. So there's a disconnect between their husbands and them, so the perspectives on life and the outlooks on life are a little bit different. Are women's lives in Doha a lot different than in other cities in the region? I have been to almost every country in the Gulf, and Qatar is decidedly different than Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, women here, I mean, we've driven across the border before, and it's just night and day in terms of the people taking your papers on the Qatari side. They're women with makeup on. They're locals, but they're, and they have their abayas on, and their hair's covered, but they're smiling, and they're chatting with you. And then you go over to the other side, and it's all men, you know, and not a lot of smiles. And I have to put on an abaya, and I can't drive anymore. So you see this huge difference, just a matter of miles, which is separating these countries. So yeah, definitely different than Saudi Arabia. The literacy rate here is very high compared to the rest of the Middle East. Okay, well, just a few generations ago, it was like a pearl diving community, a very poor community. So for example, there are grandparents or great grandparents here who might not read, who haven't gotten higher education, who barely finished high school. So for Qatar to have to revamp its entire secondary education, to prepare students for a higher education that is this, like, lofty, it's a huge challenge. And, you know, you can bring these universities here, but you need to have enough qualified students to fill them. Um, and that's why the majority of students here are expats and not nationals. The rest of the Qatari education system certainly needs time to adapt. But within the universities, changes are already underway. Shabina takes me to a graphic design class at the Virginia Commonwealth University. And one thing that's nice about these universities is Qatar kind of makes it its own. So you have these prayer areas for men and women um, because Muslims have to pray five times a day. So when you're in the middle of your university studies, you can just go quickly pray. So some students do use it as an excuse to get out of class, and they, they're not supposed to. <laughs> So, I'm originally from Bahrain, and my mom's from Saudi, but I've been born here and lived here my whole life, so kind of feel like Qatari. <laughs> I'm a junior in graphic design. And this is our classroom. 
Are there a lot of faculty or subjects that women can study now that previously they were not studying or not able to? Okay, I don't think there is a specific thing that women can't do in here. It's not like it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, in terms of the job, I think it's hard to find a family that would agree for you to, to actually work in a place. I mean, it's fine, but depends, actually. Like, I think there's only one Qatari pilot, like a, a female pilot. It's not like that there's a law that restricts you from, from working in, a, in, in anywhere, but it uh, depends on the person itself. Are a lot of students married already? Well, actually, some of the students are married here. Not many, though, in my class. Uh, some in the sophomores, and some are getting engaged, and then they get married after they graduate. But uh, it's less than before. Uh, before, it was really common to get married at 18. So do they get married to the people here, like they meet here in school? Uh, there are some cases where you meet someone in school or in, in your, like in a job or somewhere, but arranged marriage is still going on. Like if there's a woman, she has a son, for example, and he wants to get married, she's the one who finds a, a girl for him. And then she proposes to the, to the family of the girl, and then they set up a meeting, they meet, and they get married, if, if both like agree to do that. Do you think that having such a young population here in Doha is changing the evolution of the city? Maybe, yeah. I guess because uh, the young generation is leading the country right now. They're the ones making changes. Do you think Doha has a lot of potential? I do. I think there's going to be a lot of growing pains over the next 10 years in terms of infrastructure and in terms of just, like I said, growing up. Um, it's, gonna, it's not going to be easy, but I think there's a lot of potential here. And there's a lot of human capital, as you can see. It's encouraging to see the motivation and energy of this new generation, which intends to open its culture to the rest of the world. You name it, we either have it or it's going to be coming, <laughs> right? And uh, the reason why um, it's, it's a special country, especially for entrepreneurs and business people alike, is because if it hasn't been done, that means it's more opportunity for you to try and do something. And even if it has been done, there's still room for improvement, right? And so that's why I think a lot of people, they see so much hope and opportunity here in Qatar. It's like a balancing act. So where you have to try and make sure that you keep your tradition and culture and heritage. But at the same time, when it comes to progression and development, take the best that you have in the world and bring it over here here move quickly and Doha has found ways to catalyze the emergence of a local culture among other things it has launched the Doha Tribeca Film Festival and jazz at Lincoln Center in Doha both inspired by their New York counterparts I think that's what makes Qatar a very beautiful country because we can adopt and take as we already discussed you know the best of the world and that includes also learning from other people's cultures right and um, if you take a look at I don't know let's say a city or a country like Japan uh, when you think of Japan they've done a really pretty good they've done a pretty good job because they've balanced between history and tradition and culture while at the same time adopting you know you can say Western culture as well as you know new technology and so when you think of the country, you don't think of it being split in the middle. You just associate the country with development and progress and history. And I think if they did it, we can do it too. And if we only relied on ourselves to, to do everything, I mean, the development of the country would take much more time than uh, it currently has. I mean, it definitely is a concern when it comes to how will our culture evolve in the future. And um, I think that we're doing a pretty good job so far of, of managing that balance. So we've got, you know, institutions. You've got the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. We've got the Qatar Museums Authority who have set up, you know, the Museum of Islamic Art and then uh, Methaf. And so we are learning from international culture um, and trying to build our own at the same time. What exactly is Qatari culture? There are four things that I would classify being important to Qataris. It's patriotism, it's religion, it's family and pride. <laughs> so all those four are very important to Qatari people because family always first, no matter what, right? And we don't talk about direct family, right? It's essentially your uncles and aunts and your cousins and your friends who have become like your family as well. 
So you always put them first before anything else. And then when it comes to religion as well, you can, don't know if you can pick it up, you know, but we've got the mosque right now doing the call to prayer. And that's something that's really important in our lives because it's all about faith. And then when it comes to pride, since we're a new country, we need something to be proud of. And so we're proud of the development that the country's been making. In the past, when you think of Qatar, you think of a Middle Eastern country, you think of oil or gas. We don't want people to think of us as an oil or gas nation. Rather, we're a country that's cultivated. Started, yeah, cultivated. And we built from scratch, and we're trying to make our mark in the world for whatever reason, whether it's sport or education or the medical field or so on. Yeah. I heard that even if you're born here in Qatar from a foreign family, you still cannot become a citizen of this country. Well, I mean, if you're an expat and then you move to Qatar and then you have a child then, yeah, the child cannot have a passport. I mean, let's think about it from the numbers point of view, right? If 90% of the population are expats, it will only take, what, like two, three years before the whole entire um, population is has become Qatari with foreign influence, if that makes sense? And if we're at the point where we're still trying to, to balance and juggle between keeping our culture and adopting culture, then it's going to be a little bit difficult just to simply hand over um, passports to anybody that's born in the country. But I do know that there's a white paper being put in place um, where you're going to have class A and class B passports, where there will be a process for naturalization in Qatar. If you wanted a Qatari passport, you would have to give up your old nationality anyway. So you wouldn't be able to keep, you know, both nationalities. I guess, you know, it really depends on the situation. Like, I mean, I know some people who have been naturalized and they're like third generation naturalization. So they were originally, for example, from Jordan or from Palestine. And then now they are Qatari. Yeah, and they, they, they see themselves as Qatari because they were born and raised here. And that's cool. <laughs> Um, but could you just imagine if, I don't know, let's say a bunch of Chinese people became Qatari and then, every, then the national language changes into Chinese? Then, like, I think we kind of defeated the purpose of building Qatar <laughs> when you lose your Qatari identity. Luckily, the preservation of the local heritage is a major concern. The attention to detail with which the Souk Waqif was revitalized shows how this culture is directly connected with its history. Qatari culture is very traditional, but it's also very open-minded and understanding. So, I mean, we understand that different people have different backgrounds and they want to live their life that they way. So we won't impose the way that we live onto people forcefully, you know? Yeah, we look at life with an open mind. And we also forget that Qatar is a very young country. Well, absolutely. Just look at the UK, look at the US, right? Where you've got like hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, to make mistakes and then, you know, fix your mistakes. <laughs> Whether it comes to legislation or to the way that the country is going to, the country is developing or whether it comes to racism or sexism or any of these like, you know, big rights issues, right? And so for us, I think we've, in the short period of time that we have developed this country, we've done a pretty good job. <laughs> and what happens is that I think that the reason why a lot of people expect so much more from Qatar, which is a good thing, right? Because, you know, they, they hope for the best or they want, they want to see more coming out of this country, um, is because when they come down, they land, they see all the skyscrapers and the events and everything, they just automatically assume we're a developed nation. We're not. We're a developing nation, but we've got a pretty good head start. People start to expect so much more from us before we've had a chance to develop appropriately. We still need the time to change our laws, to sort out what the rights of people, you know, in the country is going to look like. We still need time to understand how the roads are going to be designed because they still haven't figured that out. Every single country in the world has a traditional and historical side to it, and then it's got the modern developing side to it. Every single person in the world wants to have the latest device, you know, they want to have the, the best house, and they want to develop themselves and develop the country. And so when people say, Oh, well, aren't you worried, you know, that westernization is taking over when your country develops, you know, when it modernizes? Then the question is, like, why can't we modernize the country and also adopt the best parts of different cultures, whether it's Western culture or Indian culture or Asian culture, whatever it is, right? We've got Sukhwagif, which shows off the traditional areas of the country. We've also got shopping malls and centers and uh, businesses and the entrepreneurial side of the country. And yeah, they can both coexist. But sometimes I get the f impression that people want us to pick one or the other. And the question is, who said, why do we need to pick? Nouveau riche oasis in the middle of the desert, Doha was no more than a village until it struck oil not so long ago. Overnight, it became the world's richest city. But with money comes growth. 
And with growth comes a change of population and values. Here, locals have now become a minority, looking for a new direction and trying to preserve their fading history. But the city is still very young and will have ample time to reinvent itself again and again.